Hi, welcome to IndyCar on the 27th of January. Now, it's always nice when I hear some good news, particularly about something which I had thought perhaps was never going to change. And today is one of those days when a piece of information came across my feed today from an alert reader who is also an SNP member. And it is an article by Pete Wishart, a man who, let's be fair, has taken a lot of criticism over the years um, for his, uh, what shall we say, his rather belligerent attitude to certain other parties. Now, before I drag down the road of starting to criticise Pete Wishart, what I wanted to say about this article is that for the first time, I can see some changes beginning to occur in SNP thinking with regards to the upcoming general election de facto referendum. Pete Wishart's article looks at how we campaign, how we gather everyone together to campaign for this attempt, you always say, to do something which has never been done before. Now, Pete acknowledges that this is the first time ever that such a plebiscite has been attempted uh, to achieve, well, certainly the end of an international treaty. It's never been done this way before, and so basically the SNP is breaking new ground here. And in fact, there is um, no real precedent for this as far as I know. Anyway, in his article, he outlines several changes in attitude, which uh, uh, surprised me initially when I first read through this entire piece. Pete acknowledges that um, in order to campaign effectively in a, a plebiscite election of this kind, the SNP is going to have to issue an olive branch to the other groups and parties in the independence movement. And to do that, he suggests, which something which many people have suggested in the past, a new independence convention for Scotland. Now, this will be something which will be discussed, I believe, at the SNP's uh, March 19th conference, which is coming up. And it appears that the branch membership of the SNP has been listened to by the parliamentary party. And branch members have been campaigning hard for a change in attitude towards other parties campaigning for independence. Now, although Pete Wishart's opinion is that and I'm going to paraphrase him here, that the SNP being the largest party with the most support and the most uh, power, I suppose, to enact such uh, a bold plan as this should be, as he calls them, the flag carriers uh, for the independence grouping as a whole. Now, this entails, obviously, people setting aside old animosities, uh, putting the past behind them. And I suppose, in, in terms of the way Pete Wishart is thinking about it, um, basically voting totally broke, as they say, Al almost just holding your nose and saying, right, this is, this is larger than party politics. We're going to lend our vote to the SNP because it's only for independence in this particular election. There is a lot of ground to be covered in this conference before such an arrangement could be agreed. And it would depend on the other parties wanting to participate in it. But what Wishart is suggesting is that all of these parties that would be the Greens, ALBA, ISP, SSP, and however many other smaller parties exist who support independence, be invited to take part in this new civic organisation, along with all of the civic organisations of Scotland. So, for example, the religious leadership of all the various religions in Scotland, um, and none. I mean, I class myself as an atheist, so I would want to see representation of those who are, do not have faith as well. And basically everyone in the independence movement who is not aligned to any party, all should be included in this uh, constitutional convention. Now, the idea behind this is that we have to walk a tightrope. As Pete Wishart points out, because this is a general election, it has to be won by parties and not by a yes campaign. So as he puts it, there will be no yes candidates. Uh, that is something which we could only do during the independence referendum in 2014, when there was a simple yes for independence and no for independence. And that was a, a binary choice. This is something a little more subtle. And so it has to be campaigned for much more carefully. And it has to be clarified so that the voters themselves know exactly what they are voting for when they put a cross on a box marked, say, SNP. Now, Pete acknowledges that some parties may not want 
to participate in this and may campaign on their own, in which case a side agreement would need to be put in place between the main grouping who are, say, lending their votes to the SNP's campaign and those other parties who wish to campaign individually for independence so that their vote share is counted towards independence. This has to be done extremely carefully in order for it to fit within electoral rules in a United Kingdom general election. So it mustn't stray over the boundaries of what would normally be in a manifesto. Now there's an interesting distinction here. Manifestos contain either promises or pledges. And somebody yesterday posting online was drawing a legal distinction here. A manifesto promise is not legally binding. So a party, for example, a Tory party could promise all sorts of things. As long as they don't pledge them, they don't have to do it. However, when it comes to an independence plebiscite within a general election, it has to be clarified that there is a single pledge involved, and that pledge is to negotiate the end of the union with the United Kingdom. That end point has to be ultra clear, so that people voting for that party, if it's the SNP or if it's called something else, they know exactly what that vote is intended to convey, because this has to be crystal clear, not only to the United Kingdom government and all the parties of the UK, we're talking about England here mainly, um, it has to be crystal clear that a vote for this grouping, whether it's called the Scottish Independence Convention or the SNP, it doesn't matter, but whatever it is, that that vote is a vote for the end of the unit, for the negotiations to begin immediately. Now, assuming that is done, there then has to be a campaign. And Pete is suggesting uh, that rather than the SNP designing the campaign itself, that the Independence Convention, that is, all of the groups and all of the parties of independence, decide on the materials, uh, on the dissemination, on the, the media that's used, who is conveying the message, what the message is, and so that everybody is singing from the same hymn sheet, including the SNP, which he says must be closely aligned with that convention. In other words, following the lead of the popular movement and not the other way around. And this is the major piece of change of thinking, which I detect from this new article, is that the SNP recognises now that the independence movement itself is much, much larger than the SNP's membership perhaps as much as 10 or 15 times as large. So it's very important to the SNP, not only just to involve the rest of the movement, but to allow the entire movement to lead the campaign. So the SNP will be taking its direction from the people and not from itself. And I think that is a vital uh, change in strategy and it's a vital shift in emphasis away from the leadership grouping in the SNP's parliamentary party making all the decisions and choices here and those choices being transferred to the people who as you know have popular sovereignty in other words the sovereignty of the people and this is the first time I think I've seen the SNP finally recognize the fact that the independence movement is far larger than they are and they require everybody to be on site. If they want people to trust them, particularly thinking of members of ALBA who broke away because of what happened to Alex Salmond, to stitch that trust back together again, there have to be clearly defined roles for each party and each grouping uh, and every blogger and everybody who's involved in campaigning. Everyone needs to understand the rules. Now, speaking of rules, I mentioned some time ago um, the potential rules or the code of conduct which the SNP was proposing for campaigning. Now I initially criticised this because I felt this was rather arbitrary that we were having a rule book basically being written by the SNP which we all had to follow. However, this is not now what is being planned. The code of conduct again is something which would need to be agreed by the convention of all parties and all groupings so that everybody knows how to campaign and what is acceptable and what is unacceptable to say in a campaigning uh, situation. Now, I know from bitter experience, you probably heard this yourself, particularly from those who were non-party political or who supported the no campaign, 
and they claimed that it was a divisive referendum and there was a lot of abuse being hurled. And that's true, there was a lot of abuse being hurled from both sides. There were some very unpleasant exchanges um, and that kind of campaigning created a very negative atmosphere around the entire movement. Peter's suggesting that with a common code of conduct, nobody would be allowed to slag each other off, nobody would be allowed to make personal insults, use profanity, uh, or make threats. And that, I think, is important, that we're campaigning in a civic, normal manner for independence, because we need to convince the unconvinced, those who are not necessarily against independence, but remain to be convinced of the main economic, political and social arguments for it. And to make those points fairly, we need to have rules of engagement. We need to know how to speak to people and how not to speak to people as well. Now, we know that there were a lot of dirty tricks in the independence referendum. However, this is different. The parties which will oppose independence, and I'm talking here about the Conservatives, the Labour Party, the Liberal Democrats, and what used to be called UKIP, I don't know what they're now calling themselves, but all of those parties will be forced to campaign as parties because it's a general election. They can't form a um, no campaign uh, simply because they still have to campaign as individual parties because they're trying to win MP seats in the same way that we are. The problem for them is that their vote is split. The good thing from our point of view, if Pete Wishart is correct and this independence convention succeeds, is that our vote will be united. Whether it is a vote for only for the SNP, depending on what is agreed by the convention, not the SNP, but whatever that vote count uh, is and however that balance is achieved, we have a united front and we have a single mandate pledge and that is to negotiate the end of the union if we get a numerical majority. It's also arguing that we are already fighting from a position of parity with, shall we say, for the for talking sake, call it the no side, that we are at least 50% uh, ready for independence. Probably more than that, we are showing in the polls at the moment at least 52%, the maximum of around 56%. Now that's a very good starting point, but we know we can do better than that. And the way that you can do better than that is by uniting all of the groupings, something which is finally, finally, got home to the SNP's leadership. Brilliant. So this is something which I think we can get behind now. It uh, remains to be seen what flesh is put on the bones when it comes to conference or on the 19th of March. Now this is an SNP uh, democracy conference, so-called emergency conference, but this is where <clears throat> what is being proposed by the SNP as their manifesto pledge is going to be debated. Pete says that after that conference they have to move swiftly to organise the Independence Civic Convention. Very fast we got, as he puts it, somewhere just a little bit more than a year to campaign for this. It's quite a short period of time to get something so large organised, but it is possible. So. As I say, this seems to be a, a shift in the mood music now from the SNP. There is a tone of urgency now, even creeping in to Pete Wishart's language, um, where he's emphasised now that there is a clock ticking in the background. All very good signs. So what remains to be seen now is how parties such as ALBA and the Greens, and the ISP, the SSP and other smaller parties react to this article. And what the official um, olive branch is that comes out from the SNP conference uh, on March the 19th. But I think we can probably predict there will be big announcements made after that conference. Anyway, aside from all of that, something else happened today, which was nice. Um, somebody, alert reader, was reading the National today, was reading the letters column. And in one of the letters, a correspondent uh, name checked me, which was very nice of him, he actually mentioned me by name and said that he agreed with my proposal um, when he was talking about the claim of right and how it had been ignored for so long by politicians. Uh, and he said that he agreed with what I said, which was that the entire claim of right should be translated from 
shall we say, the 16th century verbiage that it contains at the moment into some form of um, modern English so that everyone can understand it. And with it being abridged or edited to remove all references to sectarianism or religion from the text. Because we know from the coronation of King Charles, the famous Spaniel, that when he was giving his oath to protect and uphold the claim of right, the part of it that he promised to uphold was the religious sectarian part of it, which said that there would never be a Catholic king and that only uh, Protestant, Protestantism uh, was the religion or the faith for the United Kingdom. So that bit should be removed. Anyway, it was nice to see someone else agreeing with me in public, especially in the national, uh, and being name-checked in that way. So thank you very much to the letter writer for mentioning me. But still, it is something which we need. The claim of right is part of the campaigning literature. And also, I think the um, declaration of our growth could also be similarly translated into plain English so that the two documents in their abridged forms can be presented to the public to show them that they actually have that popular sovereignty and it's written into Scots law and it's there for all to see and it's never been repealed. And that will give them some comfort in knowing that this de facto referendum that we're proposing when they vote for shall we say the SNP or the Independence Convention Party, whatever it's called that that referendum sorry, that plebiscite promise, which is actually, sorry, not a promise, that pledge in the manifesto to negotiate the end of the union is not just a promise, that it will happen and that the people of Scotland as the sovereign <laughs> sovereignty holders in their own country have the right to exercise that choice. That also will be a, a part of the recognition process because when this independence convention convenes for the first time and these things are decided, the United Nations, the League of Nations, uh, the European Council, the European Union and many other international public organisations and bodies and unions need to be informed about what we're doing and accept the fact that this is our democratic will that we are exercising and recognise when we get a majority that that shall trigger the negotiations to end the union with England. That's also very important. The claim of right and the um, declaration of a growth from 1320 form a fundamental foundation to that as well. And this is why I've been campaigning for Salvo, um, because Salvo is the organisation which is campaigning to have our constitution represented to the public in a form that they can understand. So quite apart from all of that, um, it looks as though now we're beginning to see some real activity from the SNP. And I think since this has come from Pete Wishart, this is a very left field thing for me. I wasn't expecting Wishart to come out with this. And I'm pleasantly surprised. And so for the first time in a long time, I'm not saying anything negative about Mr. Wishart. He has actually said what all of us have been thinking all along, which is that the SNP now needs to hand over responsibility for the framing of this referendum within the general election to us, to the people of Scotland who are campaigning for the union to end. And that's the recognition of the fact that we have that sovereignty. And it's the first time I've seen any um, SNP parliamentary uh, MP actually acknowledge that publicly for the first time, that this is the time for the power to take this decision uh, to be transferred to the people through a civic convention of all parties, of everyone who wants independence, all groups, all clubs, all churches, all religions, all no religions, everybody. And that is vital. So thank goodness for that. This is the start I've been hoping for. Now let's see what happens in March. That's it for me today, but remember, keep the faith because in keeping that faith and not allowing yourself to be divided by the United Kingdom and its antics in trying to split the independence vote and by recombining back into what we should have been all along, Civic Scotland, the popular sovereignty of all of the people of Scotland, we can win this and win it well. 
I've seen predictions actually, and I think the bookmakers are now actually offering odds on Scottish independence that look very favourable for the first time. And not only that, but the bookmakers seem to be anticipating a general election actually before the end of this year, according to some of my sources. However, that is just guesswork. Nobody can substantiate that. But things are starting to shift. Uh, I think the logjam, the political logjam now has crumbled. The SNP now can see the target ahead. And hopefully the whole gender recognition reform act nonsense will be left in a cloud of dust now as we all stampede towards the civic convention after March. Anyway, I now expect the SNP to act on this kind of um, proposal from Pete Wishart. If it's coming from him, I think, then it must be becoming policy within the leadership group, because Wishart is normally a great defender of the SNP's custodianship of power. And this is the first time I've seen him suggesting that that power should be relinquished to the people in order to guide the independence campaign. So that's it for me. I'll see you again, I hope, uh, over the weekend. I should be back uh, on Sunday at some point, although I got quite a busy day. But in the meantime, keep the faith and remember, things are beginning to happen. See you soon. Bye for now.